morning. Well, I tell you what, it's a good day. You doing all right? Awesome. Wonderful. Well, we are continuing our series on the life of David, and I want to encourage you this morning that if you have your Bibles, open to 2 Samuel chapter 11. If you're following along on your uh, Bible app, the Version Live, you'll find all of the scriptures there. We'll have, of course, the scriptures here on the screen as well as provided for you out in the hub. And uh, we want to share a message today that the Lord has laid on my heart called The Anatomy of a Sin. Any series on the life of David really requires two specific messages that you cannot leave out. One has to be on David and Goliath and the other has to be on David and Bathsheba. And today we're going to read from 2 Samuel chapter 11 in just a moment. I want to identify a word that I'm going to be using quite a bit during my message. And the word is the word sin. The word sin in the Hebrew means to miss the mark. In my title I've called it the anatomy of a sin. And the word anatomy Google defines as a study of the structure or internal workings of something. And that's what we're going to do. We are going to look at the internal workings of David's sin and David's action in his life. This is going to appear as a progression. It's not a series of events, but it is a progression of actions taken by David. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, beginning at verse 1, we begin the story, and it's Quite an interesting beginning. It says there in verse 1, in the spring. Well, that's where we are, right? We're we're in the springtime. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Amorites and besieged Reba, but David remained in Jerusalem. I don't know if you realize this, but the month of March is actually from the Roman word Mar, which is the god of war. In the springtime is traditionally when countries have gone off to war. And this was no different for the Israelites. They had gone off to war, but there was something different this time. What was different this time was that their leader, King David, the mighty general of their army for so many years, the one who had won so many victories for them, was not going with them. You see, David had become so important to Israel that they could not risk having him lost. I want you to think about that for a moment. His men actually said to him, David, you are so valuable. You are so important to us. If we die, it's no big deal. But if you die, we will lose the battle. So David stayed back at home. David was at home while those who would normally protect him were away. David, in a sense, was actually vulnerable So we're going to look this morning at six actions that David took while he was away from his men, while he was vulnerable, that make up this anatomy of a sin. Action number one, David saw. Think, wow, that's pretty simple. Well, let's look at verse 2 there in 2 Samuel chapter 11. Again, we know that it's, it's sometime from spring on, David is alone in his city. His army is gone out to fight. And here in verse 2, one evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman. Here's the next word, bathing. The woman was very beautiful. Now in the Hebrew, that phrase, walked around, it has a very negative connotation. According to Bible scholars, this phrase actually indicates that there's something of a very questionable nature which is about to occur. Think of that. 
David was up on his rooftop. He was walking around. Something questionable is about to occur. Was this premeditated? We don't know. Was David looking for something to get in trouble with? We don't really know. But David sees Bathsheba. She's described as being very beautiful in our text. And this very beautiful woman is taking a bath. There are scholars that presume in one commentary that I read that we've moved now beyond just springtime and it's now in summer and Palestine is a, is a, a desert um, environment and the heat would become very oppressive. And so in the evening time, rather than stay indoors, people would escape the heat by getting outside. And so David, in order to escape the heat, he's walking around the roof of his palace, Bathsheba. She was escaping the heat of indoors and she was taking a bath and it happened to be outdoors as well. The Hebrew term here for very beautiful, I want you to understand this, it is actually strikingly so. And the scripture only speaks of three or four people in all of its pages who can be identified as being this kind of beautiful. This is not, this is not a, a, an average uh, person. This is someone whose beauty is obviously very, very noticeable. In sight of this naked and strikingly beautiful woman, David begins to make a series of decisions. David is in the wrong place at the wrong time. Normally he's with his men off to war, but now he's all alone. He's vulnerable. No one is with him. And when he sees Bathsheba, when he's in the wrong place at the wrong time, there is something inside of him that is awakened. It is a desire that that literally comes to life and it is awakened in him. Now we don't know for sure if, if this is just an accident that happened, we don't know if it's something that was very intentional, if David was really just out on the prowl looking for some opportunity, we don't know for sure. But we know this, that David stumbled upon something. And stumbling upon something, friends, isn't necessarily sin. I want you to understand that. But when we go looking for something in the first place, I want you to know you can be sure that you will find what you are looking for. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 7, we read this, If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is, look at this, crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Sin was crouching at David's door. Whether he accidentally stumbled on this situation or whether he heard a rumor in the palace hallways and he thought he would check it out for himself, either way, he stumbled on it and now sin is literally crouching at his door. The same is true for you and I whether it's something that we accidentally stumble upon or whether it's something that we have some forethought involved in, I want you to understand that sin is crouching at our door and it desires to have each of us. Now, I want you to know something. Sometimes things happen. Sometimes we're looking for those things to happen. In this situation with David, David found it. Whether it was by accident or intention, he found it. In our lives, that we, if, if we're looking for it, we're going to find it. There's no doubt about it. And it could have ended right here. Do you realize that? This story could have been over right here. But David had a choice to make. Today we're going to look at the structure. We're going to look at the, at the inside workings of what happened in David's life, and it all began with seeing something. His first action was seeing something that he shouldn't see, but the question is, now what's he going to do? So let's read on in verse 3, because we're going to see action number 2. 
Action number two is simply David sent. Look at verse three there. And David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. Let's look at action number two here, sent. And I want you to notice that there's two words in those two scriptures. There's two words sent in those two verses. And the first one, and they're very different. They're they're actually different levels of the word. Now, would it hurt to find out someone's name? He sent word to find out, I just want to know what her name is. After all, really I should apologize for my rudeness because I I was staring and I think she saw me, so I need to apologize. So in order to apologize, I have to find out who she is. So would you guys go find out for me what her name is? Okay? Do do we justify sin or, or what? We justify sin. When we, when we are being tempted, we can justify just about anything. And that's what David was doing. He wanted to find out her name. And you know what? Again, this all could have ended right here. Oh, hey, her name's Bathsheba. Would you guys send a message for me and just tell her, hey, I'm really sorry. I won't walk up you know, there anymore uh, at that time. So you know, I, I just want you to know, I, please, I apologize. But that's not really what he did. He acted on what he saw. And now he liked what he saw and he wanted to find out more. He wanted to find out more and he started with her name. I'm just going to start with her name thinking that would satisfy him, right? Isn't that the way sin is? We think, I just want a little more. I want that just the next thing that's going to make me feel a little bit better and that's all. I'm not going to go any further than that. But that's not what David did. Because after he sent for her name, he sent for her information, he sent to find out who she was, he sent someone else, but not to find out who she was, but again, to take that next step because now David is acting on his desire. The need was for more. He wanted more and and he was unsatisfied with just knowing her name. Maybe he sat around the palace for a few days knowing her name and really fighting with this urge, but he ultimately lost out And then he sent word that they would actually bring her to him. Knowing her name, it just wasn't enough. So he goes to this next level of that word sent. And the the next people that he sends is actually to retrieve her, to bring her to him. Maybe he's thinking, you know, I've got some time on my hands. It would be good if I, if I just reach out and meet a few more people that, that are in my kingdom. I didn't know this person, and so I'll, maybe I'll have a new friend today. He was, again, justifying what he was about to do. The second level is a huge leap down the road. Before David even sends these men to get her, he knows that she is a married woman because when they, he asked them what they should, uh, what her name was, they said that her name is Bathsheba, Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Now that tells us something about this guy. This was not just a guy living in Jerusalem. This was one of David's soldiers, and as a soldier, he was not. Hebrew, he was Hittite. He was basically someone that somewhere along the way had moved into David's army, David's trusted men, and he was not a resident of Israel as far as his nationality was concerned. He would have been considered a mercenary. He was in the employment of a foreign king to do the foreign king's fighting. He was a trusted man. David would have known who he was. And when he sent for them to get her, he already knew that she was married. He already knew everything that he needed to know to make the right decision. And yet, he decided, I'm going to kick down one more barrier between myself and sin. He was vulnerable. 
he was unsatisfied with just knowing who she was, so he sends to get her. He had gone from accidentally possibly stumbling on something that he saw from the rooftop to now he is intentionally trying to bring something about that is going to happen. This is a huge departure. He's now creating an opportunity. In Proverbs 6.27, it says, Can a man scoop fire into his lap without his clothes being burned? David is playing with fire, and David is going to get burned. He's given in to sexual desire that's been aroused in his heart and in his mind. Now, I want to recall for a moment the message that I preached a couple of weeks ago that David was a man after God's own what? Heart. And now... David's heart has been filled with sexual desire for another man's wife. You say, Pastor, how can this be? Remember what I said about the heart? It is evil, desperately evil, desperately wicked. And that's where David's heart was. Although he was a man who had been after God's own heart, now his heart had been filled with desire for another man's wife. The truth is, friends, that you and I, every one of us, we are going to be tempted at various points in our lives. What we do, though, with that temptation is the important thing. You see, being tempted is not sin. I want you to understand that. It's not the temptation that is the sin. Scripture says that Jesus was tempted. He was in the wilderness and he fasted and prayed for 40 days. And after that, the Bible says that Satan tempted him in three specific areas. Jesus did not sin by being tempted. We look at Jesus' response and he responded with the word of God. He responded with obedience to his heavenly father. But David, being now tempted, how he responds makes all the difference in the world. You and I, how we are tempted, or what we do when we are tempted, makes all the difference in the world. I want you to look at, uh, at, at uh, 2 Timothy here with me, uh, chapter 2 and verse 22. Timothy's mentor and his father in the faith, Paul, tells Timothy, flee evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. You see, David had begun pursuing a course of action. He's not avoiding it. He is actually initiating that course, and that course has him literally moving on a crash course with sin. When he saw her, was that sin? Not necessarily. When he asked for her name, was that a sin? No. Even when he sent for her, was that a sin? No. Up until this point, it's, it, I can't say that it's been innocent, but it's not been sin until this point. We're at this point, this line. I want you to look at James this morning, chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. James says, But each person is tempted when they're dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. Friends, this is the progression of sin that is happening in David's heart even as we speak in the middle of this scenario. This is what's happening to David. He's been tempted. He's being enticed. He's being dragged by his own desires further and further down the road towards sin. This is something that we all deal with in our lives. He's on a crash course with death. Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 12 says, There is a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. David still thinks he's in the right. No big deal. Hey, I'm kind of bored, you know. 
I, I'm walking on my roof. I accidentally see something. I, I want to apologize. So maybe if she comes over, we can have a, 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 a you know, we can have a, a, a cup of, of tea together, and and we can I can apologize. You know, there's no harm in that, is there? Once again, <laughs> once again, he's justifying his actions, and he is literally scooping hot coals into his own lap. He's being drug away. Friends, you know what? Sometimes we investigate sin. Sometimes it's an accidental thing. Sometimes it's on purpose. But we think, well, let me just check this out a little bit. No harm, no foul. And then sometimes we invite it into our homes. I want you to understand that this is what David was doing. He was inviting the potential for sin into his home. He had gone beyond just an innocent glance and now he's making a plan. He's justifying that plan, but he's making a plan and he's inviting that sin into his home. Friends, in our homes, we need to protect our homes. We need to protect our families. And in our lives, we can investigate and then take that next step to invite. I'm going to invite. But, you know, I, it's, it's harmless. There's no really, no big deal. I'll just, I'll just check it out. But when we invite sin into our homes, we are literally scooping hot coals of fire uh, into our own laps, and it's impossible that we won't get burned. Let's look at the third action, the third step in David's process here. The third one is that David slept. Now, I don't think we're talking about actually sleeping here. Let's look at Second Samuel chapter 11, the second half of verse 4. It says, she came to him. She was just being obedient to the people that had brought her. I don't know if she had the ability to refuse or not, but she came. She shows up at the palace and he slept with her. I want to continue on reading the next uh, two sentences. Now, she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. Now, I want us to be clear here that David has everything anyone could ever want. He has everything. He has the wealth. He has the, 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 the he, he can do whatever he wants. He has many wives. He has, and, and I don't understand this. I, I, I'm, I, don't, I don't know really how this can be justified as related to the scriptures and who God is, but he has concubines. He has women in his possession, and they are there for his pleasure. He has many. His son Solomon, between concubines and wives, would have nearly a thousand women. David had probably hundreds. So I don't think boredom is really a justification. I, David had whatever he wanted, and he had it at his disposal right now. David had everything that he could ever want. But that did not satisfy him. That was not enough. I want you to understand, David is is a man that talks about meditating and hiding God's word in his heart. Do you know what God's word says? And David would have known this. He would have had this at his disposal. But God's word says in Exodus 20, 14, in Deuteronomy 5, 8, you shall not commit adultery. Well, David thinks, well, you know, I haven't, I haven't really done anything yet. Then we read in Exodus, or excuse me, Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 10, if a man commits adultery with a, another man's wife, with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress are to be put to death. He's scooping hot coals into his lap, thinking, I'm not going to get burned. This can't hurt me. Do you see the foolishness? Of this man. This, and this is probably 
at this time, one of the most powerful men, if not the most powerful man on the face of the earth. And he's thinking, I cannot be touched. I cannot be burned. In Genesis chapter 3, God gives Adam and Eve permission to eat everything in the garden except from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And I guess that wasn't enough. The point I'm trying to make is this, that as humans, we kind of have a track record that whatever we have really isn't enough for us. We always want more. You know, we can blame the enemy for tempting us, but the truth is, it's our own evil desires. It's our own heart that drags us away. It's what's happening inside of us. And that's the way it was with David, this man after God's own heart. He was being enticed and being drug away by his own desires because what he had was not enough. He had to have just a little bit more. Jesus, in his Sermon on the Mount, takes the idea of the sin of adultery one step further when he says in Matthew uh, 5, verse 27 and 28, you have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you that everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Friends, sin is more than the physical act It's something that occurs in the heart. Are you with me? Jesus said, you've heard the Old Testament law and that said don't commit adultery. And that's what David, it says in this step, that's what he he was doing. He He slept with her. But we know that from Jesus, it's not the action, it's what's in our heart. That's where the adultery can take place far before any physical activity would ever happen. It's more than a physical act. It's something in our heart. And let me add one more thing here, and I think that this is really important, and I want you to hear what I'm saying on this, okay? And, and, and I'm, not, I'm not writing um, doctrine on this, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you my, my heart on this. In, in our text from this particular verse, verses 4 and 5, we read that, that Bathsheba has purified herself from her monthly uncleanness. Now, of course, we're talking about her menstrual cycle. And in temple worship, if you were bleeding, you were considered ceremonially unclean. Okay? And what that meant was that if you had a cut that was, that was bleeding, a wound, you could not participate in temple worship. A woman who was going through her menstrual cycle could not go into the temple to worship. She would have to go through a process of being declared clean. It was something that they dealt with. It was something that they understood. And I want you to get this. She is going through a process of of, uh, purification so that she is qualified to participate in the temple worship. And David, obviously, he's involved in this process. And my question is this, why care about being purified for temple worship if you're in the midst of adultery? That's stupid. But yet we do the exact same thing. We can be dealing with some sin in one area of our lives and then in every other area of our life and in our relationship with the Lord, we can literally act like everything is okay. And that's what David and Bathsheba were doing. But you see, the reality of this is going to come home very quickly. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 13. But encourage one another daily as long as it is day so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. This is what's happening to David. His heart is being hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. He has thought, I can scoop these hot coals into my lap and I will not be burned because I am King David. I have killed the giant. I have led God's people Israel. I am the king. Nothing can hurt me. He's being deceived 
by sin. And his heart is growing hard. This man after God's own heart who wrote himself, Thy word have I hidden my heart that I will not sin against thee has now broken. Not only don't covet your neighbor's wife, but he's broken the command, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Sin has hardened his heart and you and I, sin can harden our hearts as well. David was literally pretending that everything was okay and we often do the same thing. But the reality sets in when David receives word from Bathsheba and says, I'm pregnant. David, he made himself, I I got got to... This is something I, as I was preparing and as I was praying over my message, this is something that came to my heart. And I want to tell you this, that David made himself one with his sin. What does the Bible say uh, about a husband and wife? What God has joined together, let no man take apart, right? Literally, that the, Jesus said the two become one, okay? That is the, it's, it's a, a symbol of marriage, Okay, and we know that part of it's emotional, but it's also sexual. Okay, all right, relax, it's okay. We can we can talk about this. All right, it's sexual in nature. David's had had literally joined himself to his sin, and it, and it was a sin. A, a part of it was a sin of sexuality, sex outside of marriage. He had joined himself to his sin, and you and I, when we knock down all the barricades that God has set up for us between us and sin, we join ourselves to sin. We invite it into our homes. We invite it into our lives, and we become one with that sin. David thought his adultery, he could do it and that he'd be unaffected. If you think that you can invite sin into your home, sin into your life and become one with that sin and that it will not affect your life, you are sadly mistaken because it will affect your life. The effects now of David's sin are becoming undeniable. What's he going to do? Well, he reverts back to his favorite word, sent. So number four, action number four is sent. Look at Second Samuel chapter 11, or yeah, chapter eleven, beginning at verse six. So David sent this word to Joab. Joab is his general. Send me Uriah the Hittite, and Joab sent him to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was, how the soldiers were, and how the war was going. This is called small talk. Okay, that's what he's doing. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. He's telling him, I want you to go get cleaned up. I want you to go home, put your feet up. I want you to relax. So Uriah left the palace and a gift was, uh, from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all his master's servants and did not go down to his house. David was told Uriah did not go home. So he asked Uriah, haven't you just come from a military campaign? Why didn't you go home? Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents and my commander Joab and my Lord's men are camped in the open country. How could I go to my house and eat and drink and make love to my wife? As surely as I live, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to him, stay here one more day and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. At David's invitation, he ate and drank with him, and David made him drunk. But in the evening, Uriah went out and slept on his mat among his master's servants. He did not go home. Anybody have an idea about what David was trying to do here? (laughs) Let me tell you something. You don't have to watch TV to get this. It's right there in the Bible. I mean, this is, this is salacious, folks. This is, uh, David is, he is doing something here. He's got a plan. And his plan is, I'm going to invite Uriah to come home. And I'm going to, you know what? He's going to, he, he's a man. 
He has sexual desires. He's going to want to go home and he's going to want to sleep with his wife and she's going to get pregnant and guess what? Bang! I'm off the hook. Come on. It's a cover up. That's exactly what it was. He's appealing to Uriah's most base appetites. And David understands this because he's just given in to it. The problem was that Uriah, as a Hittite, not even a Hebrew, had more character than the king, a man after God's own heart. He said, surely I would not do this. The second attempt, well... If I can't just send him home, I'm going to have him stay at my house and I'm going to get him wasted. And then I'm going to send him home. And then he's not going to have any inhibitions and he's not going to be able to think straight and his wisdom won't be able to take over his mind. His character is going to flee from him. And then he's going to sleep with his wife. Numbers chapter 32 and verse 23 It says, if you fail to do this, you'll be sinning against the Lord and you may be sure that your sin will find you out. David was trying to cover up his sin. Friends, when we try to cover up our sin, I guarantee you that it will be found out. It's going to be found out. And not because God wants to, to beat you up. But God wants to draw your heart back to him. And finding that sin out is what has to happen before we can be drawn back to him again. David thought he could keep it secret, but he just couldn't do it. I want you to understand no matter how, try, how hard we may try to keep our sin under wraps, we're going to be discovered. Which leads us to David's action number five. David wrote. In the morning, verse 14, it says... In 2 Samuel 11, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In it he wrote, Put Uriah out in front where the fighting is fiercest. Then withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. So while Joab had the city under siege, he put Uriah at a place where he knew the strongest defenders were. When the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. Friends, David never touched Uriah. Never laid a hand on him in violence. But his actions were responsible for his murder. He knew what the result of this letter would be. He could no longer cover up the sin, so he tried to eliminate anyone and anything that could draw the connection between he and his sin. And so he had Uriah killed. He thought that he had covered it up. Friends, we cannot escape God's watchful eye We cannot hide our sin from him. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7, the apostle Paul writes, Do not be conceived. God cannot be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. When you take those hot coals and you pour them in your lap, you will be burned. You reap what you sow. We can't slip one by God. He's aware of our attempts to cover up our sin. David, the man after God's own heart, successfully now had broken three of the Ten Commandments, coveting his neighbor's wife, committing adultery, and now committing murder. This man after God's own heart. I'm so glad it doesn't end there, though. Action number six, quickly, he repented. 2 Samuel 12, verses 13, Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. You see, God used the prophet to confront David about his sin and his response, even though it was after the fact. And I don't like that. I wish it was before the fact. But it wasn't. It was after the fact. But he repented. 180 degree change of direction. And I'm so glad that God wasn't done with David, but God had mercy on David and he forgave him. You might have heard of a, of a man that pastors the church in California. He had a sort of a well-known TV program for over 30 years, uh, but his name is Robert Schuller. Pastored the, the Crystal Cathedral, 
the TV program that he hosted was called The Hour of Power. He passed away earlier this month. And a man uh, named Joe McKeever did a, a blog story on him, and he tells the story of when uh, Schuler was a young boy, he took piano lessons from his mother. And as every piano student knows, once a year, you have a piano recital. It's where you justify all the money that you spend on your kids. And Schuler stepped up to the piano and he began to play the piece that his mother had assigned him that he had practiced for so long. And in the middle of the piece, he went blank. Now, I've done this before. On a piece that I had memorized and I went blank and I could not remember anything. He was humiliated, he was devastated and all he could do was walk off the stage. And afterwards, his mother said to him, Robert, if you ever mess up in the beginning of a piece again, I want you to do something. I want you to finish with a flurry and then no one will ever remember what happened in the middle. Friends, when we mess up, God doesn't close the chapter. But we have the opportunity to repent and finish with a flourish. God was not done with David, but David had stumbled terribly. I want you to understand, friends, that like David, all of us have sinned, and Scripture says the soul that sins is the soul that dies. And that's a problem for us. Because we all miss the mark. That definition of sin that I told you about at the beginning, we all miss the mark. We sin. We can't be perfect and the price for that sin is death. But the good news is that the price has been paid for us. We can be forgiven. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4 and 5, it says, Everyone who breaks... Uh, who, who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he, meaning Jesus, appeared so that he might take away our sins and in him is no sin. Friends, Jesus was tempted just like you and I, but he was without sin. So when you and I, in our in our pursuit of God, in our walking with Jesus, in a relationship with him, when we sin... Say, Pastor, what do I do? Well, we, we go to Jesus and we say, Jesus, I know that, that you face temptation and that you didn't sin, but you can identify with my sin, with my failing, with my temptation, and that you died that I might be forgiven. Friends, that's, that's what God wants us to do God would have loved if David at some point in this process would have, would have turned and changed, but God was still willing to accept his repentance. Now, that's not permission. I want you to understand that. But God is a merciful God. David had an incredible start to his life and, to, and his career, but as we've seen today, he really stumbled terribly. And I think that there's some of us in this room that can really identify Maybe not with David so much, but, but maybe Robert Schuller. We're kind of in the middle of our, of our recital. And maybe you've blanked out and you've forgotten everything that you've ever known and, and you feel humiliated because you, you've just stumbled in sin. Friends, don't stay there. Don't stay there. But get up and dust yourself off and repent and finish with a flurry because God is a merciful God and he has so much in store for you. Would you pray with me? Father, this morning, I pray that the story of David, many of us have heard so many times, I pray that the truth of it would really impact our hearts. Father, there are some of us that have been investigating sin. We've been checking it out. And your Holy Spirit is speaking to us and saying, you know what? You need to get your heart back. Get your heart back to me. Maybe some others of us, we've, man, we're inviting it in the house. 
Father, I pray that that we will that we will listen to your Holy Spirit and that we will stop where we are and say, God, forgive me. I don't want to bring sin into my house. I don't want to bring sin into my life. And I certainly don't want to become one with my sin. So, Father, I pray that that you'll help me. Scripture says that that there's no temptation that's taken you or taken I, me, that, that we cannot find a way of escape. Literally, God has made a way of escape for us. And if we want it, he'll give it to us. He's provided it for us. The question is, what are we going to do? When we are faced with sin crouching in our door, we've invited it in, we've opened the door, what do we do? Friends, I pray today that the Holy Spirit will be speaking to our hearts. And whether you're sitting out in the hub today, or whether you're here in the sanctuary, if you are being confronted with not only temptation, but you are in a place really where you're kind of in the middle of your sin, you're in the middle of your situation, you say, Pastor, I don't really know what to do. The only thing that we can do is to do what David did, and that is to repent. To say, God, forgive me. God, I've sinned against you. I've sinned against heaven. I ask for you to forgive me. That's what David prayed. David said, my sin is ever before me. He acknowledged his sin before God. And God was merciful. God forgave him. If you're here today, if you say, Pastor, I I need God's forgiveness today. I'm trying to follow Him, but I find myself in the middle of a situation where I, I just, I've wanted more than I should have. I've not been satisfied with I, with what I've had and I've, I've crossed boundaries and I've kicked over barriers. And I've invited sin into my, into my home, into my heart. I'm becoming one with that sin and I need God's forgiveness today if that's you. I want you to slip your hand up because you're just saying, Lord, forgive me. I'm acknowledging my sin. Just close yourself in with God. Nobody's looking around. I I just want you to have a private moment. God, that's me. God, I need your forgiveness today. Father, I thank you that you are a God that forgives. I thank you that you are a God that is merciful. Father, I pray today in the name of Jesus. God, that repentance will come, that restoration will come, that forgiveness comes. Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior today as a result of this message, I would encourage you to contact us here at Silver Creek Church by simply emailing me at kevin at silvercreekchurch.org. I'd love to be able to pray with you, and I'd also love to send you what's called Walk by Faith. It's a simple week-long devotional that we've prepared in order to help you as you begin this journey of faith in Jesus Christ. I pray God's blessing upon you today. Thank you.